for y'all now? Anyway, praise the Lord. Glad that you're here today. Went down to Belize uh, to meet with the Baptist Association down there to talk about our future meetings. We have a pastor's conference scheduled and down there and dealt with them what we want to deal on the topics and the issues and deal with some of the issues they're facing now and try to provide some, some kind of counseling for them. But praise the Lord. Yeah, but it was a good time and a very uh, needed time uh, for the ministries that we do down there. We we're also able to work with the conference center and finish negotiating the contracts that go with the conference. We also sat down to make plans for our 2014 mission trip uh, and what we'll be doing there in 2014. Uh, we start kind of planning that the middle year. This year, our, every other year, our kids do camp. The next year, they do a mission trip. They take our kids to camp. We take them on a mission trip. Whole church is invited to participate in that mission trip. But 2014 is the next date, so mark your calendars down for June of 2014 for Belize. Uh, right now, the uh, group that's kind of preparing to do the study of where we're going to be and what we'd like to do is looking at Belmapan and uh, working with pastors there. When I go in, in April to meet with them for the pastors' conference, I'll meet with some of those pastors from, those, from that city, which is, by the way, a lot of people think Belize City is the capital. It's really Belmapan is the capital. We'll meet with the pastors from there and discuss that, that conference as well. But got a lot done. Appreciate the time that I uh, had with those pastors, and they're so, always such a blessing. They send their regards, and they send their deep thanks and gratitude for your commitment to minister to that part of the world from Houston, Texas area. So uh, just to say hey from them to you, they love you, and they continue to thank God for you. And so do I. Praise the Lord. We get into this next year. I couldn't think of a better sermon series to go into than called Taking Care of Business. Amen. Uh, now, when I talk about taking care of business, I'm not talking about in the context of business business. In fact, I started to uh, play the chorus of that little old rock and roll song, but thought that might, <laughs> might grieve the spirit. But especially when I went back and looked at the lyrics of it. I, mean, I remember the 70s and 80s when that song came out, Taking Care of Business. Basically, the lyrics were, our musicians probably the only people who know the lyrics. It basically said, if you don't want to work for a living, just become a musician. I didn't write it. I mean, don't get mad. But that's, a, that's pretty much the content of it. So I really won't go uh, with what we're talking about here. So. But there is that element in the idea that there's a, there's a business that needs to be taken care of. You'll forgive me this morning because I am uh, chewing and sucking on a lozenge here because what I did bring back from Belize uh, was a head cold. It's always fun getting on a plane about two or 300 people that are coughing and hacking. He said, oh, Lord, not me, Lord, not me. Lord, not me. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> came back with some of this stuff in my head. But we'll get through it if you can, if you can tolerate me uh, smacking here every once in a while. But when we talk about taking care of business, I'm talking about our life as a whole in general. And obviously, we know it's not a business, but the idea of business in the context of the affairs of our life. Getting things in order, getting things in the right priority in our life. And our spiritual walk with God, our foundation being right, our walk with God being right our family, our finances, and every other part of our life. You know, it really is a, an element that we need to, to give diligence to just as if it were a business. And the first and foremost thing, obviously, is the foundation of our life. You know the parable of Jesus that he gave when he talked about the wise man and the foolish man who built their house, one on the rock and one on the sinking sand. And just uh, whether, whether you're a wise man or a foolish man, one thing is true in this parable of Jesus is that the wind comes and the rain comes and the flood comes to everybody. The righteous and the unrighteous, the just and the unjust, it rains on all men. The wind blows upon everybody, and sometimes it's the winds of uncertainty, sometimes it's the wind of destruction. But, but winds blow and rains come and floods come. And those things symbolize the difficulties of just life in general. And the only way to get through life in general is to have a foundation that is sure, a foundation that can stand. And that foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ and his word to us. And Jesus shares with us the importance of our commitment to him. So the business that we have, obviously, if we get into, as we get into this series of messages called Taking Care of Business, is this, this, this understanding that we have to have a proper relationship with God, a proper relationship to the Holy Spirit, a proper relationship to Jesus Christ, being established so that we can stand when the winds and the rains and the floods come, because they do certainly come. Part one of this series is called uh, First Steps to Freedom. And in the context of this message, we're going to go to the book of Malachi. And I know some people who are Baptist and been in church for some length of time shudder when you mention Malachi. Because the T word is in there. I don't know what the T word is, don't you? Tithe. So, uh, but I'm not talking about tithing today. And I really don't believe when Jesus uh, speaks to the prophet 
Malachi that that's the heartbeat of what he's trying to get across to the people about their tithes and offerings. He addresses that. But I want to talk about this in the context of where we are in our lives. And I really want this to be a personal exam, not only for me, but for you. And I've tried to let this be a real penetrating sermon to me. In fact, much of the last week that I spent while I was in Central America was, was in the context of what I'm talking to you about today for my own personal life, where I am in my, in my walk and where I am in my own devotions and what the Lord is saying to me. So I really want us to take to heart what the Lord would have us to say today. And I believe that if we can get first things first, the issues settled that need to be settled, foundational issues taken care of, then no matter what wind, what rain, what flood may come in your life this year, you're going to be able to stand. You're going to be all right. You're going to find the grace, the presence, the power of God as God wants to demonstrate it in your life. But we cannot uh, mingle around in the areas that are unimportant. We go right to the heart of the issue. We go right to what God wants to say. And that's where the people are in the book of Malachi. The prophet is speaking on behalf of God, and God is speaking to the people. And in the book of Malachi, God begins to make some accusations. Just blank statements out there. And when he makes the statements, they're so, so uh, perhaps difficult maybe, are powerful, are so just big that the people are, are, uh, respond, and they respond with questions. He says, so that you, you've profaned my altar. How have we profaned y'all? You worship me in vain. How have we worship you in vain? So as he makes a statement, they respond with a question and to which he responds with an answer. And I believe the context of him making these statements is to get them to ask the right questions so he can give them the right answers. Because sometimes when we look at our lives, we don't see the real problems. And if we can't discern what the real problems are and we think that something is a problem and it's really not the real problem, although it may be a problem, but it's not the main problem. It may be a fruit of a problem and not the root of the problem. If we don't get to where the roots are, then we're going to continue to have a lack of answers and a lack of the supply that we need from God to be what God wants us to be. So we won't look at Malachi, and we're going to focus in on chapter 3, because it's kind of the, the heartbeat of the, of the whole book of Malachi. And I, I remember about seven, eight years ago, I preached the whole book of Malachi. But what you see in chapter 3 is kind of a, a heart of it. And I, I know that when I was in evangelism, I preached from this chapter in a, in a sermon series that I called Stages of Revival. And, it, and I think I even preached that here once or twice, that in, in, in looking at this passage and how God deals with his people. But there is something here that I want us to dig down into today, and in digging into the Word of God together, let's learn something from the Word of God. And let's let God speak to us in a way that, hey, that when we walk out of here, we know we're taking care of business. We know where we're doing, where, where God wants us to be doing. It, it would just be terribly embarrassing for God to come and, and for me to die today and to stand before Him and see I missed it on everything. Amen? It would be terribly embarrassing to, to go through a worship service day and this be our last worship service and we just did it all wrong. Wouldn't that be just kind of, oh, <laughs> uh-oh. I just don't want to live my life that way, and I do not believe that anybody here really wants to live that, their life the way. Our life should mean something. And that's the heart of the book of Malachi. When the prophet speaks to the people, God is saying, listen, I've got something bigger for you than what you understand. And you're going to have to get to, to where you understand as well. So let's look in Malachi chapter 3, and let's begin with verses uh, 1 through 12, all right? We're going to read all 12 verses. He said, Behold, I'm going to send my messenger... And he will clear the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Then here's the question, but who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and he is like a fuller's soap. And he will sit as a smelter, a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi. And refine them like gold and silver. Why is he going to do that? Well, here. So that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and is in the former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. And I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against those who swear falsely and against those who oppress the wage earner and his wages the widow and the orphan and those who turn aside the alien and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your father, you've turned aside from my statutes and you have not kept them. Return to me, the Lord says, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you will say, 
Here's, how shall we return? Will a man rob God? You're robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You're cursed with a curse, for you're robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows, then I will rebuke the devourer. Well, okay. Praise the Lord. If I can read my angry years, I'll rebuke the devourer for you so that you will not destroy the, the fruit of the ground. Nor will you turn on that spotlight to be helpful if you get to see what's on stage. He said, then uh, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruit of the ground. Nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, so that, says the Lord of hosts. All the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Now we'll get the lights back on in a minute, and hopefully the more lights than that will come on, amen? Uh, so I'm talking about the ones internally will come on. But as I look at this message, there's some things I really believe that people read into it and they think, that's, that's what this is about. It's, and, and some of you may be sitting there and say, oh, it's about tithes, you're going to preach about tithes. And, you, and just like the nation of Israel, if that's our, our mindset, we certainly miss Everything that God wants to say to us in this moment, it just blows right by us and we miss it completely and we just, we don't get the message that the Lord God has for us. I want to do this message here in kind of in two parts. The first part, I want to give you four points. You know, in, 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 in dealing with these four things, what, just kind of what I'll call PowerPoints on, on the message of four things that I believe that we can find from these verses that we don't need to miss, all right? And sometimes we just miss them because we're looking at the wrong things and the wrong words. First is this, the people's perspective of the problem. They're knowing that things are not right in verse 11. They see that things are not where they should be. They're looking at the, 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 the fruits are not coming uh, upon the crops the way that, like the, the wheat grows, but it doesn't put off any, any grain. The grapes are growing on the vine, but before they come to fruition, before they ripen, they fall off the vine. There's a major problem. It is causing economic chaos. I mean, we're talking about an agricultural type of economy and things are not going well. It really looks bad. And if you ask the people, what's the problem? The problem is the crops aren't working. Fields are not producing the fruit that they should. The grain is not coming alive. The, 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 the grapes die before they even come to fruit. That's the problem. We have a problem. Now we look in our own culture and we think, oh, we got a problem. We got economies this and this is that. We don't like this guy. We don't like that. And we have all these things that we think are the problem. We look in our, our, our business, perhaps in our own life or where we work and where we do bit. Well, it's, it, I have a boss that doesn't work. Or I have an employee, you know, that's the problem. In your home, it's my husband, or it's the kids, or it's my parents, or it's my wife. Uh, what's the problem, you ask? The problem is we don't see the real problem. The real problem, you know, from the people's perspective, they thought the problem was just failed results. Maybe you feel that way in your life. You look around, you see things that just aren't the way they should be and aren't where they should be and you, you see just failed results. But I want you to see it from another perspective. The real problem in verse seven tells us it's not failed results, it's failed people. From the day your fathers, from the day of, the, of your fathers, you've turned aside from my statutes and you have not kept them. The problem, the real problem is the people's hearts aren't right with God. They aren't where God wants them to be. They aren't doing what God wants them to do. And therefore, the real problem is not what they think the problem is. It's a different issue. The third PowerPoint here is this. The real solution to the real problem is repentance, according to verse 7. Return to me. I'll return to you, says Lord Host. You say, how should we return? That's a good question. I'm going to tell you how to return, he says. But the real problem is the fact that, you know, they, they uh, don't see the problem. God knows the problem. God presents the problem to them. But he also says, here's the antidote. Here's the cure. Here's how, here's how we're going to deal with the issue. Somebody praise the Lord for lights. Amen. Here's how we're going to resolve this problem. So we have the truth of the matter is that God begins to introduce the real solution. And the real solution to the problem was what? Let's, let's get down to the place where you come back to me. And you get right with me. Now, in dealing with this, there's that fourth PowerPoint I want to talk to you about is the hindrance to the solution. God says the, the reason that we're not where we ought to be is because your hearts are not right with me. You know, it says when the Lord appears, he's going to come. He's going to deal with that. He's going to take the impurities out of your life. He's going to set like a refiner of silver. He's going to set like the, the person like the, like who comes to do the wash, like with fuller soap. And he's going to clean up your hearts and clean up your lives so that, when you come to the Lord and when you walk with the Lord, that you do it in a right way and in a holy way, in a way that brings honor and glory to the Lord. Now, I love this passage when he says, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The Lord's going to come to his temple. Now, you understand, hopefully, 
that if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, not just that you have the information, but you've experienced the transformation, he's in your life, that you are the temple of the living God. This body has become the temple. But not only that, the scriptures even says that when we join together, that we are lively stones and we corporately are the temple of the living God. Now, everything we're reading in Malachi is prophetic of what we're looking at here today in the fact that Jesus would come and he is the messenger. Some would prepare the way before him, John the Baptist. All this is prophetic, but also there's this, in the midst of all this prophetic lessons, of which we've dealt with in the past, so I'm not looking at that element of it. I want us to look at the principle of it. What is God doing in, his people's, in these people's lives? And what is God saying to these people in this situation? He's getting them ready for his coming. I believe with all my heart the Lord is coming. I believe he came. I believe he's coming again. I believe it could be today. This could well be the last church service you ever attend. All right? This side of heaven. It could really be that way. Now, you might not think so. You're not living with that sense of urgency. You need to get your heart in a place where you can get that sense of urgency. But I do believe he's going to come. But in the, in the midst of all that, I do want to say that I do believe that God wants to send himself in a full way prior to his second coming where we experience real revival in our life. When the Lord comes to the temple in this context of, of experiencing God in just a f fresh way. Through our lift groups, we've been doing that study called Fresh Wind and Fresh Fire. Where we're hungry and we're anticipating and we're praying for, for God to do something genuine and re refreshing and real. Like, like David the psalmist who said, Lord, anoint me with fresh oil. I believe there's that element and that principle from God's word in this lesson as well today. And God is saying, I want to do something in the midst of my people. I don't believe God has changed. And we'll see that in just a moment. God makes that declaration. I'm still for that. I believe God wants to do something in your life today. I believe if you're a Christian, there's no reason that you should be living or I should be living in mediocrity on any level. I don't believe we should be living in, in spiritual want in our lives. That the Lord is my shepherd, he's providing, and as I'm following his shepherding, his leadership, I'm sensing and knowing and realizing the fullness of his provisions for my life. I believe the God of grace wants to do in, in, in a very practical way by sending strength and renewing and revival to our hearts. It's, it's the same thing. This, I want to come and do something in our lives. What do I need to do? God showed me what he wants to do. So the first thing we talked about are those four PowerPoints of really understanding what the real genuine problems are and what, what, what hinders that from happening. The second part of this is what do I need to do if I'm going to take care of business? If I'm going to get where I need to be in my walk, in my life, what is going to have to happen? And I really believe that Malachi 3 gives us some insight and some biblical principles about that. First is this, I need to have a heart to hear a word from God. Now, a lot of people say, oh, I do, I, yeah, I'm ready for a word from God. But when it comes, we don't like it. If it's something that that's cuts across the grain. When it comes, if it's not something that just says, oh, I'm such a sweetheart and I'm such a blessing to God, then I don't want to dismiss it. I want to ask you this morning, do you really have a heart to hear a word from God? Remember the parable of the sword and the seeds? Jesus is giving us the parable about the man who's going out and he's casting the seed and the seed is the word of God. And they fell on different kinds of ground, but only one ground was prepared and ready so that when the seed fell on that ground, it brought forth fruit, some 130, 60 fold. A lot of fruit was produced from a seed that falls upon ground that's ready and that's broken and it's and, and ready for God to do something. See, I, I believe that a lot of people are not there. They should be. There's enough going on in their life that they should have gotten that place, but yet they're still holding on to the strings of self-sufficiency. They're still kind of holding on to, I can get myself. I, I think, you know, I, yeah, I've got, some, I've got the wind and the rain, the floods, and some problems, some crisis, and I'm going to gut my way through this. I, you know, I'm, I'm a man of means. I'm going to make it happen. Do you have a heart today that's willing to hear what God would say to you? Do you have a heart that says, God, whatever you want to deal with in my life, whatever you, want to, whatever you want to bring up, whatever that issue might be, my heart is ready to it, to do it. Because when God speaks that word, like verse 7, the word he gave to them is pretty much similar to what it, what it ought to be to us. Come to me. And so often we don't hear that. We might hear the issue of what our particular weakness might be, our, our failure, or our sin, our stronghold. And that comes just like a, a raging sign. But through all that word that God, if he's bringing up something like that in your heart that's not right, then you need to hear what's really being said. God said, come to me. This is in the way. It may be greed. It may be lust. 
It may be immorality. It may be all these things he's mentioned here. People that oppress the wager and the hire and the orphan and the widow and the people who are concerned with their adulteries. And all that. It may be one of those kind of things. But behind that, in that, can, do you have a heart that hears that part that says, come to me? Or are you hearing some kind of liturgical, uh, legalistic list that you have to kind of conform to? Don't miss this. A heart. Where it really hears in the midst of all, and God does deal with that because he's the refiner, he's the purifier. But what is the first word? Come here. Come back. Come home. Come to me. And that is the message of repentance. For, for me to come to God, I got to quit going my way. I got to quit pursuing my avenues. He said, if you, you return to me, return to me and I'll return to you. That's really the message of, of, of just, you know, of, of repentance and yieldedness to the Lord God. What do I do? How, how do you return? I, well, I think it's all in this part. First of all, do I have a heart that can hear that kind of voice from God? Or am I still focused on what I want, what I can't get away with, that I'm just missing what God's saying to me and what the heart of the issue really is? And the Lord says, return to me. He said, the Lord whom you seek, in verse one, will suddenly come. Isn't that beautiful? The word there, seek, is the word panah, I believe, the way it's pronounced in the Hebrew language, which really means to beg after something, to strive after something with all your heart, to pursue it with all your being. Just, you know, come, don't let anything, that means to beg after, to search after, to strive for something. And I believe if today, if you could just hear that word, when God speaks to you, come home. Come home. It's, it's time. If you can, you can hear those, those words of life, from the Spirit of God, that if they could just ring in your heart for a moment, then I don't believe all those things that you had made such mountains out of will be such mountains anymore because you'll see them in the light of what they really are and there'll be this heart that says, I want you, God, more than I want that. Amen. Return to me, I'll come to you. But that's not a message that people want to primarily listen to. Do I have a heart that can hear that? Do I have a heart that's teachable? Do I have a heart that's broken up and prepared like that? And so often we experience things in our life and sometimes it's the wind, the rain, the floods that are preparing us for these moments and we just miss it. We miss it completely what God wants to do. So the first thing I believe is, do I have a heart to hear from God? The second thing about this is, do I have eyes that, are, that, that look to see the presence of God in my life? I, I'll beg for a moment away from all you theologians who would go into this long uh, oratory about how God is omnipresent. Yes, he is omnipresent. But he's talking about God saying, yeah, God, God is obviously omnipresent in the nation of Israel when he's speaking in the context of this story. But he, he's saying, hey, I am withholding my presence. Although I am there, I'm not showing myself there. Although I am there, I'm not manifesting my presence there. And a lot of times, you know, we, we can easily say, well, yeah, God's in my life, Jesus is in my life. And the fact, well, maybe that is the absolute 100% truth. He's in your life. But is he on your life? Is he living and moving through your life? Are you experiencing his life? If I start with a heart, but it then should go to the place where I begin to look to see God move in my heart, in my life. And, you know, I, I really want more than anything else that, you know, God be present in such a way that it becomes obvious to me. You know, I don't have to strain to see God. I, I see God in the midst of my worst situation. I start begin to see God there. He calls him the messenger of the covenant. And I've talked about the covenant before on many occasions. Jeremiah 31, 33 kind of gives you the four aspects of the new covenant. First of all, he says, part of this covenant, which he calls himself the messenger of, and this is the gospel basically, you know, I'm going to forgive you of your sins. That's the very thing that stands in the way of us returning to God. I'll forgive you. Bring them. Come to me. Bring them. You know, I don't want you to see it. I already saw it. <laughs> I don't want you to know about this. I already know about it. It's a secret sin. No, not to me. <laughs> the darkness is light to me, remember. I, 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 for, I forgive your sins. Well, Brother Joe, you don't know what I've done. <laughs> you don't know what he's done. Maybe you need to look for a moment and see what he's done. Instead of being so preoccupied with yourself. And see the great demonstration and sacrifice for your sins. The second thing the covenant says, and I'll write my law on their heart. What does that mean? I, I believe it means we'll have a desire that are desires that are godly. And I, you know that if you've ever experienced revival in your walk in life, or even the day you gave your life to Jesus, the first thing you want to do is what God wants you to do. I just want to serve the Lord. I, I love the Lord. And that should say number three, but somehow the numbers thing got all out of whack. Third thing is I'll be their God. That's a good thing. That's provision. That's protection. That's power. That's grace. It's whatever I need, whenever I need it, because God is my God. 
I don't have to look to anybody else. I don't have to look to myself. I don't have to look to the world. I don't have to look to you for, 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 for acceptance. God's my God. I don't have to worry about being popular. I don't have to worry about being rich. I don't have to worry about you loving me. God's my God. God before me, he can be against me. God's my God. The, the fourth aspect of the covenant is this, and, and you will know me intimately. And that's, 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 what, that's what's in the voice that says, come to me. It's fellowship. It's walking with God. It's a heart that can hear God. It's eyes that can see God and that want to see the, 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 the presence of God in our life. And you know as well as I, the more you become mentally, spiritually aware of the presence of God in your life, the more powerful your walk with God is. The more you realize the things that God doesn't like as well as the things that God does like. And the closer you get to him, the more aware you become of those things. It's like he's writing those things on your heart and you know what he likes. And in, in reality, you begin to realize what he likes and loves is, well, that's what you like and love. And what he wants, you, that's, just, that's just what I want for my life. And you just begin to see his presence. I mean, in the presence of God. Now, if you just see the presence of God in your family, you see the presence of God in your life, you see the presence of God in your, your, your children, you see the presence of God in, if we can just begin to see the presence of God around us, it'll literally change the way we, we speak. It'll change the way we act. It'll change what we do in secret places it, when we see the presence of God. It's like driving down the freeway when you see the, the highway patrolman set on the side of the road. In that sense, if you're driving 70 in a 50, you're checking your behavior pretty quick, aren't you? Why? Because you, the recognition of authority. But you understand that the, the authority that's there is not there to judge you. That authority that's setting on the side of the road is to protect you from all those people who won't drive 70 and a 50. So don't be one of them. <laughs> the idea here with God, though, is it's, it's hard to compare it to that Department of Public Safety employee when he is the God of, of, of all gods and the King of glory who wants you to come to him, who wants you to walk with him, who wants you to fellowship with him, who wants you to know him. You have eyes that can see that? Are you still looking at God like he's the patrol officer? Ready to handcuff you if you ever slow down long enough. It's not the way it works. The third point I want this, here's what it takes to take care of business. A surrender of my will so that God can purify me without my resistance, without my rebellion, without me fighting him over every issue the things that are cancerous to my spiritual life that I would seek to embrace and love will literally destroy my life. Or will I come to the Lord with a heart that's broken and eyes that are longing to see his presence in my life with a will that says to him, whatever you want. Not my way, but thy way. It's not what I want. Because what I want, if I look often enough and close enough, I'll see those are the very things that are poisoning me in my walk and in my life. There's a lot of people who will come to me and say, Brother John, I want God to help me. But they're not willing in their own life to do what God wants to do in their lives. They're not willing to surrender. They're not willing to make those choices. They're not willing to give up. They're not willing to forgive. They're not willing to turn. So I guess you could say they really don't want God to help them, do they? Not yet. God says, when I come, I'm going to come and I'm going to purify the sons of Levi. I'm going to purify my people, you know. So that means if I'm going to allow God to purify me and my heart really is broken up and my passion is to see his presence in my life, then I'm going to say, whatever it takes, I give this to you. And by the way, let me tell you how good God is at this. This is the beauty of the word of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit in a service like this. That when I even say something like this, what is it that the Holy Spirit has the unique ministry of bringing up to your heart and mind in that very moment what it is? So that the pastor doesn't have to sit here and make the list. I've had people say, oh, I think you're reading my email. I ain't got time to read that stuff Frank sends me. I'm not reading anybody's email. You know? Or you're listening to my phone calls. Or you stepping on You know, you have to realize that the Holy Spirit is active in the lives of his children. That God loves you so much and he sent the, the great teacher, the comforter, the encourager, the minister of gifts into your life. And it's his full-time responsibility 
Ultimately, the bottom line of the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to exalt Jesus Christ as the Lord of every area of your life. And so if there are areas of your life where Jesus is not Lord over, he's not reigning over some area, then the Holy Spirit is going to come through the preaching of the word and through the teaching of the word. And he's going to speak to you, whatever those issues might be. So let me just put it bluntly. Whatever came up, deal with it. Take care of business. Resolve that issue before God, before you leave this place today. Put that on the altar. Say, God, I've held on to this like I was in love with it. And this is destroying my life because you show me what it is, and I don't want to do it. I've put me first instead of you. I, I, I've been selfish. I've been greedy. I've been cut. Whatever the issue might be, just get it on the altar. That's how you do it. You surrender. And then be willing. And sometimes there may be some strongholds in your life. You, just, you literally can't step back and say, it's so big. You have to charge it. Like charging hell with a water pistol. You've you got to go at it with the word of God. You've got to go at it with commitment. You've got to go with prayer. And sometimes fasting. Yes. You don't run from those things. You, you run to God and he takes you right through to the victory. Amen. The very things you don't think you can overcome, those are the things that God wants you to walk in victory over. And it's amazing. God says, That's, my desire is to, is to make you pure. Why? Because he's pure. Because he's holy. He calls him here, you know, in, in Scripture, you know, the Holy One. He calls him here uh, we, we, in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit. So God's working out purity in our lives. It's a great question that comes up in Psalms 24, 3. And the question is this, who can ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who will stand in his holy place? I don't know. Well, I'm glad you asked. Because the psalmist tells you in the next verse, he that hath clean hands, a pure heart, who's not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Now, that doesn't mean you went to the restroom and washed your hands during the break. All right? Or that you don't cuss. What God is saying here, I, I'm dealing with internal issues, and I'm dealing with external issues. Some of these things in your life are external. Some of these things are internal. Some of these things are things that, they're, they're acts of disobedience. Some of these things are thoughts and, and things you've held to and attitudes and, 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 and unforgiveness, perhaps, or bitterness. or and Sometimes there are issues of the heart people can't see, like greed and covetousness. You know, God said, I just, I'm going to come and I'm going to purify the sons of Israel like silver and gold and I'm going to deal with them. And he says, who's going to be able to abide the day of his coming? The word there in the Hebrew language for abide, is, we would spell it in the English language, K-U-W-L. Closest pronunciation I can give is cool. That's cool. I'm sure it's a little more Hebraic with it. Cool. With a little ugh to it. <laughs> who, who, who can be cool when God shows up? I know we, 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 we all have probably have different ideas of what it means to be cool. Some of you think a cool is a picture of the Fonzie, you know, back in happy days. You know, cool means that no matter what comes my way, I can handle it. Cool means, you know, I've got everything I need whenever I need it. Cool means there's nothing going to mess me up. Cool means I've got it all together. Who's going to be that way when God shows up? Nobody. Because when he comes... He's going to start dealing with the issues of your life. And if you want to follow this little Christian path, but you don't want to deal with the issues of your life, you're not going anywhere. Amen? You're going to take care of business that way. Because when he comes, he's going to start dealing with the things. He says he's going to be like the fuller and like a refiner. There's two words given. One is that word fuller. It's the word means to. It's a word which they, they get from cleaning laundry or very filthy, dirty things. Well, they would take them out of the city and they'd get by the riverbanks, and they would throw these filthy garments down, and they would get them mixed in with the, whatever kind of soapy detergent they could use to clean with in those days, the, the lies and all that stuff they'd put in there. And then they would either beat them with sticks or stomp them against the stones or beat them against the stones. When the Lord comes, he's going to get you clean. Now, it may feel like sticks at times, but he's going to get out the stuff in your life that's been a hindrance to you living for him. But the intention is not bad. The intention is righteous and good and best for you. He's also like a refiner. That's that word Tahir. It, 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 the root of this word has to do with being bright, unadulterated, pure. That's what God's plan is for your life. That's what God's plan in the Old Testament was for the Jewish people. They would be the light bearers, the light messengers to the world of a great God. And it's the church's responsibility right now in this generation to be the light bearers. You're the light of the world. But if there's filth and garbage and things, it's, it's like trying to drive through a storm and your headlights are all covered up with mud. You're not going to see where you need to go. You're not going to do it and you're headed for an accident. So we have to get the mud out and the trash out and the filth out. And the Lord says, I've, I've come to do that. Because, and then he goes on, because when I come, he says, I'm going to be swift to judgment. Why is he going to get us clean? So we're not judged. 
So we walk in freedom. So we walk in victory. Taking care of business, Job understood when he said, When the Lord has tried me, I shall come forth as silver. And we know he went through a great deal of trial. He came forth as bright, light, shining for the glory of God. Who can abide the day as it coming? Because when he comes, he appears like a refiner and like a fuller. First Peter says, how do we do it? He says, we have purified our souls by obeying the truth. In other words, we respond to God's word. That's God's action in us, being the refiner and the fuller. That's where the heat is. That's where the, that's where the power comes, where God to cleanse our lives so we can shine bright. Question. You have a heart that's pliable? Sometimes we say, well, well, I'm not what God wants me to be because, and we start going all these reasons. We don't, we don't see the real problem. We fail to see the problem. God says, I want to show you the problem. It starts with you having a heart. It can be plied, pliable, and teachable, and broken. You have eyes that long to see the presence of God. Open my eyes. Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 1, that lengthy multi-paragraph prayer, one sentence where he's praying, Lord God, open the eyes of their understanding. They might see the, the height and the depth and the breadth, the length the inheritance of the saints in light. Let us see. At that point, as I begin to see, and as I'm hearing the voice of God saying, come, come, come to me. At that point, my will is surrendered. God, get this junk out. I confess to you. And then comes that last thing. That if that's happening in our life, this is when he starts dealing with a presentation of acceptable gifts. Because if I can get to this place, then I'll begin to manifest a love that will show itself and prove itself with a presentation of acceptable gifts. And the first one is ultimately myself and my heart. You see, if they listen the way God wants them to listen, they'd realize that money was not the issue here, was it? And some of you, you know, you think money's the issue. You've, you've come up with a, I don't know how many dozens of excuses not to give. And that's not the issue at all. It's not what you give, it's how you live. How are you living? You live with a heart that's humble and broke before God? You live with eyes that long to see the glory of God, the presence of God in your life? Is there a will that surrenders? Say, God, whatever you want, you got. Allowing God to filter and to clean because your heart is open and your will surrendered to do what he wants to do in your life? What's the real issues here? That you may offer unto the Lord offerings in righteousness. Then shall the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant. What made them so pleasant? What makes your gifts so pleasant, Lord? When you do give, when you do, when you do service, when you use your talents, when you use your spiritual gifts, when you use your finances, when your family, when all these things become as an offering to the Lord, that's pleasing unto him. It's acceptable in his sight. It has a sweet aroma to him. That's worship is what he's talking about here. Your worship is tainted. You worship me in vain, he told them. And when you do give, it's not accepted. I don't accept those kind of gifts. Well, I've been giving them regularly. <laughs> doesn't matter. Some people say, well, I, I give and God doesn't bless me. Because you don't give the way God told you to give. With a pure heart. With a life that's right. There's a couple of things, and I'll close with this very quickly. Twice in, in verse 2 it says, I will come. Return to me, I'll return to you. I will come. I will come. That's some good news, is it not? I will come. I will come. Now, what I want you to see there is that that's in Malachi. But the Lord hadn't changed his mind. Because in verse 6, it says, I am the Lord, I change not. And so God is telling people, I want to manifest my presence in the midst of my people. It hasn't changed. In this age in which we live, God is saying, I want to manifest my, pre my presence in the midst of my people. I want to manifest my presence in the midst of Joe Arms' life, in the midst of his family, in the midst of his church, in the midst of his finances, in the midst of all the issues of his life, the business of his life. I want to manifest my presence there. I am the Lord. I change not. We use the word immutable, which means if God is for something, he's always been for it. So if this is what God is for, he's always still for it. If, what God, if something God's against, it means he's always been against us. If God says something is sin, it's still sin, all right? We think that, well, maybe God has changed and become a little more sensitive to our, our needs and wants. No, we're talking about God wanting us to allow us to sin. 
God is going to come is what he's saying. I love in Hosea, he refers to himself as the former and the, and the latter rain. The people living in that part of the world understood it. There's, there's some parts of our nation, I mean, they clearly have defined seasons, all right? It's not like down here. You get a few days of winter and the rest of it's all summer. Maybe a month of spring. But God is saying, you know, just as there, just as there is a time of the year when the, former, when the former rains come and there's part in the later year when the latter rains come, you know they're coming. Except in some kind of, you know, uh, atmospheric dilemma of some sort and oceanic things and all those things and drought comes. It, the rains didn't come for a reason. So you understand that I will come. I'm just like that. If there's certain, it's going to rain a certain season, it rains. It's supposed to rain. If it doesn't rain, it's because it's not supposed to rain that time of year. What is God saying? I believe he's saying to us, there are some things about me that are predictable. And then he tells us what they are. I'm for what I've been for. I'm against what I've been against. I'm for revival. I'm for manifesting my presence in the temple, my people. I'm, I'm, I'm for showing up. I'm, I'm, for, I'm for coming and, and taking care of business. So we ought to be able to understand that just from this passage, it is the will of God to show himself mighty in our life. The Old Testament, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth looking for someone who he can show himself mighty towards, someone whose heart is pure. God says, I want to show myself strong towards. Don't you want that? As I said in the beginning, we don't want to stand before God in some point in the future and realize we wasted so much when we knew so much and we didn't take it to heart. The heart wasn't teachable. We had no vision, no perception of the mighty God working our life. No will surrendered. We were too strong, strong-willed and too hard-hearted. I love to go back to verse 1. It says, I will clear the way before me. God says, I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to show up. I'm going to show up strong. And it kind of, I really believe the bottom line of Malachi 3 is, how do you want me to show up? Judge or purifier? How do you want me to show up? And you can ask yourself, I just, how do I want God to work him out? He's going to do one or the other because he's, he's told us. He doesn't change. He's for a work in your life. He's for revival in your life. He's for a stirring. He's for his strength and his power to be manifest in your heart and your situation and the business of your life. So what we need to do is do just what God's going to do. He's basically, I'm going to take care of business. So why don't we? And I can't think of any better way as we start thinking about the beginning of the year here is to come to the place in our own hearts and lives and say, you know, I want to know if the Lord gives me this whole year that I have lived it to the fullest for his glory. I haven't wasted it. I think about what could have been or what might have been or what I should have done. What, no, I've given, I've given myself to the business of worshiping God. And if I do that, when I come to some point in time throughout the year of review, then it will be review and not regret. It'll be rejoicing and not regret because I'm doing what needs to be done in my walk in life of God. It's all grace. It's not law. And I believe you understand that. Dear, can you hear? When the Lord speaks, come. Come. Come back. read a reference. Well, my wife read it to me from Facebook about a young man, not young anymore. He'd been involved in ministry. I'd had a part in discipling his life as well as my brother had and someone else had. And he called himself a prisoner of war in the context of that little in his spiritual life. And my mind is this. Knowing everything you know, why are you still a prisoner of war? And God says, if you'll listen, come home. Come home. Come. And I'll come to you. Would you stand with your heads bowed? Could well be today that that voice.